Today's guest has made millions of dollars, lost it, and made it all again multiple times. He's a serial entrepreneur with so many businesses, it's absolutely unbelievable, and he's a best-selling author. It is, of course, Daniel Priestley. I arrived in London with nothing but a suitcase and a credit card. I turn up and I have no idea what to expect. And then a year later, we had four million pounds of revenue. Not only was I making a lot of money, I was living a crazy life. Every single day was something amazing. Always staying in the best hotels, great restaurants, great parties. I remember walking away that night with just hands full of cash. It was a bit like a movie. You can't go from a million a year to a million a month without putting everything back in. Imagine you had a box. Every time you put 7,000 in the box, 35,000 comes yeah. out of the box in 10 days. How much would you put in the box? The reason I have vivid memories of all this stuff is because it was emotional. I remember the, those ups and downs and I remember how I feel and I remember punching a wall and like being so helpless. You're traumatizing me here yeah. going back through all of this stuff. What would you say to some people that now are trying to start a business, maybe 20 years of age? What should they do and where should they focus their time and energy? I can't understate the importance that... I'm really excited about this episode because I got a message this morning yep. from our mutual friend, Harry, yep. and said, oh, have you um, have you read this book? It's a key person of influence. I thought, no, oh, that looks interesting because we got the guest on today. And let me the tell you, how actual, crazy is the actual that? author, Daniel Priestley. And this guy has got one hell of a story. You guys have been asking for proper businessmen on and we've delivered today. He is honestly sure. such a goat. And yeah, the stories that he's about to show, I'm hoping he's going to share, are just going to change people's lives. So maybe this is one of the episodes that people might not want to watch as much because he isn't clouded, clouded on social yeah. media, but they definitely should, shouldn't they? Yeah, this guy is serious, serious goat. Today's guest has made millions of dollars, lost it, and made it all again multiple times. He's a serial entrepreneur with so many businesses, it's absolutely unbelievable, and he's a best-selling author. It is, of course, Daniel Priestley. Woo! Welcome to the podcast, man. It's very good to be here. <laughs> what a great shirt you've got on. I know, we're matching. <laughs> oh, it's you two this time. Oh, yeah, yeah, me and you last matching. time, but now. Now, something crazy that happened this morning is I got a message from our like coach, and he said, you may have already read this, but I thought I'd share it with you regardless. And it's your book, Key Person of Influence. And I was like, what? We got him coming on today. That's so crazy <laughs> that, that really that happened. Cool. That's yeah. great. So why should people listen to you that might not necessarily know you? <laughs> okay, great. Uh, it is a hard one to start with. So my experience, I guess, of 21 years of, of being an entrepreneur, um, born in Australia uh, and lived the last 17 years in London. And um, so currently where I'm at, I've got um, a group of companies. I've got a tech company that we've built, uh, which is now a global business Um it's recently raised a little bit of money at around 20 million valuation. And I've got a group of services companies. So we've actually built a growth services company through acquisition. So I've been buying companies. Um, I've sold a few different businesses. Um, and I have an entrepreneur accelerator uh, that has had about 4,000 entrepreneurs go through it. Uh, we've had offices in London, Singapore, um, Sydney, Toronto. Um, so I've been kind of exposed to the global culture, I guess you'd say, of business. Uh, and then over the years, I've been writing books. So I think there's four books in the Entrepreneur Journey series, uh, which maps out kind of starting up and, you know, the first million and then kind of scaling up and, and doing the marketing campaigns and digitizing and creating digital assets. And then a couple of other little books as well. The latest one, Scorecard Marketing, is a very tactical book. And then on top of that, three kids and a cat and a beautiful <laughs> wife and all those sorts of things as well. So I, I don't know, have, have I covered a, enough bases? Yeah, so it sounds like you've done a ton. Every single guest we've had on the podcast has a thriving business and makes a ton of money. And you're probably wondering how you can achieve the same. Look. I get it, starting an online business seems so daunting, but it's really not. That's why I use Hostinger, because it makes the process really simple. What do you actually need to start a business? Let's break it down. A logo, a website, and a custom www web address. Hostinger is an all-in-one platform that can help you with all of that in just a few clicks. Every morning when I wake up, I've made money without lifting a finger, and it's all due to the power of online sales. Hostinger has absolutely everything you 
need to launch a website or online shop in minutes without the need for technical or design skills. During my many years in business, I've launched all manner of websites and I'm blown away with how smooth the process is with Hostinger. For less than $3 per month and one click, you can launch your own WordPress site or Hostinger's drag and drop website builder. Whether you're looking to sell physical products like me, drop ship, start a newsletter or advertise your portfolio and services, with Hostinger, the possibilities are endless. If you want to start making money online while supporting this podcast, go to hostinger.com slash strike it big to get everything you need to create a website for under $3 per month. And as a special bonus for you guys, use the promo code strike it big for an extra 10% off. Do you feel like you were a born entrepreneur or were you taught it through maybe experiences? Uh, do you know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur very young. Um, when I was a teenager, Two things happened. I got a job at McDonald's and the owner of the, our franchise was this guy called Randy and he took me under his wing and basically told me about how business works and how franchises work, in particular how McDonald's works and how some are owned by company and some are franchises. And I was really fascinated by this idea that he never came into the business, like he was never there. We only saw him at the Christmas parties and things like that um, and that a whole bunch of teenagers ran this multi-million dollar restaurant. And I was fascinated by that. And then I got this book called The E-Myth, um, yeah, which know yeah. Well, yeah. you know it well. <laughs> of course. Um, and I just kind of was like, whoa, this is amazing that you can have businesses. And that kind of got me um, super excited. And then the third thing that happened was when I, I was a naughty kid at school and I had to clean out this cupboard and um, I found this magazine called um, the, the Rich 200 and I started reading all the stories of these 200 people who had built businesses and I noticed that a lot of them had started companies and I just got bitten by the bug. So I started buying business books and wanting to be an entrepreneur and trying little entrepreneurial ventures out. Yeah. So is a naughty kid at school just a, a disruptor, shall we say? Yeah, well, school school is kind of like... Doesn't like them, does it? No, a lot of the things that make you a successful entrepreneur don't really work at school, so... Mm enrolling a team is called cheating um getting the smart kid to do your homework in business is called having a cfo um yeah. and um uh, if you disrupt and capture everyone's attention that's a bad thing but if you do it as an entrepreneur they put you on the front cover and call you a disruptor mm. um so that's what i was i was just ahead of my time you're a disruptor <laughs> yeah it wasn't bad yeah. i was just ahead of my time in yeah. fact the most uh, common piece on my school report was disruptive influence should try harder that was all over. And you were certainly report. that on TikTok, weren't you? With, yeah. with the wigs. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, exactly. You know, it doesn't do you bad in the long and, run. And they would have called you a class clown. That's and, it. And that you've sort got of stuff. it. And and now look, you've captured millions of people's attention by being a little bit of a class clown. Yeah. And it's worked for you. So yeah, a lot of the things with school, they want us to be something called component labor. So if you think about the schooling system, it's really built that there are these machines, these businesses that are already out there, and those machines need parts. And they need to create people who fit perfectly into those little machines, um, and that is the you know that's the whole industrial revolution system that we've come out of. But the school system is very slow to change, so it's going to still produce people who are good for the industrial system, um, but it's not going to produce people who are ready for the economy that we're in at the moment, which is a very different economy. How did you balance like reading? Because you mentioned you're buying lots of books and actually taking action on the things that you're reading. Because I feel like a lot of people, they buy so many business books and they know everything, but they don't actually do anything. Or watch videos and ask for advice and don't do anything. So I moved out of home when I was 18 and one week. And um, very, you know, very quick, uh, I moved into a house with five of us. My bedroom was a garage, an empty garage that had a concrete floor and a roll up door. And basically I put some carpet on the floor and, and all of this sort of stuff. And I had no money so much, like so much. No, I was thinking about this the other day. I had so little money that I uh, would, I would always go to the butcher and get all the offcuts, which they'd sell really cheap in the, um, the veggie boxes, which were like the throwaway vegetable boxes. And I'd make those up into big soups and I'd kind of have the same meal for like a week and all this sort of stuff. And my hobby at the time, uh, the only thing I could afford to do was just walking around nice neighborhoods. Um, <laughs> that was my, that was my affordable hobby. I could just go for a walk through. Is that a bit of visualization as well, like seeing those yeah. houses and like yeah, looking through the yeah. gates and just going, "Whoa!" Like someone lives here. Like there's actually a person who's this is their family home. Mm. Um, so that was kind of uh, cool. And um, I I went to do a business degree at university, and I you know, they kind of like got us to write a business plan about an idea and I sort of saw 
these kids. I was in this weird estate thingy um, and there was all the kids hanging out on the street and I thought, okay, you've got a spot of market need. I'm going to put on a nightclub party and we're going to see if we can get like a, a party for under 18s because I thought, oh, like I've just discovered nightclubs and under 18s can't go. I'm going to do an under 18s nightclub. So this was my big, big idea. So then a mentor figure said, well, if you've got an idea, you should just pick up the phone and make three phone calls and see if you can do it. So I said, okay, fine. So there was this big green shed across the field. I said, I'm going to ring the number on the side of the shed because you can hire it. We're going to do a party at the shed. So I ring up and they say, look, we've tried this in the past. It's a disaster, wrong venue. Why don't you just do it at a nightclub? Oh, okay. I hadn't thought about actually using a nightclub. So I rang up the nightclub that we would go to on a Tuesday night, spoke to the general manager and he said, yeah, send me through a proposal. So I, okay. So I send through a proposal and uh, he says, come in and have a meeting. So yeah, what do you want to do? Well, you guys are normally closed through the school holidays. We want to put on a party on a night that you're closed. I, fine. Okay. Well, here's how it's going to work. And he gives it, gives me a bit of a deal and I, wow. Okay. So we've got to do this thing now. So how, how are we going to get, how are we going to get six, 700 Were you um, surprised that he took you seriously? Very. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How old were you at the time? Just turned 18. Wow. Yeah. So I went in with like a, a um, went to the uh, opportunity shop and bought a tie and a, you know, a suit and all that to go in for the meeting. So but you're he, approaching this as a promoter more than anything, I'm assuming. I didn't have that name. I didn't okay. know. I didn't know what I was approaching. You're just as, the guy. So I was just trying to do it. We're going to run a party. So, um, do you think that gave you an advantage going in without knowing everything that's involved within that like type of business? Because you were looking, maybe, how can I disrupt things? Yeah, I think um, it was just kind of like it's kind of like when you're driving and you can only see as far as the headlights in front of you, but you just have to kind of, you know, drive and make your way as you go. So, um, yeah, so I basically created this little flyer and we printed up thousands of flyers and we, we had a rule and we thought to ourselves, okay, if we just give these flyers to the girls at the shopping centre, they will tell their friends and then the boys will hear about it and they know the girls are going. So all we have to do is if we just make sure the girls go, then the boys will go. And then this was our big plan. And it worked. It worked so, so well. <laughs> um, so we, we filled the nightclub and... Um, I remember walking away that night with uh, hands, had like just hands full of cash. We had everyone paid five or ten dollars on the door, had you know seven hundred people there, so it was kind of like we had to pay some to the club and we had to pay some to other things. Um, but it was just awesome to have hands full of cash, and it was like wow. And uh, it was were, pretty were you taking a percentage of the drinks as well, or was that down to the nightclub? So we had to cover the costs of opening the club, right? And um, the club kept the bar mm. and we kept the door. So the cost of opening the club, I think it was like there were five security guards and there were a certain number of people here and there. And um, it was actually pretty cool the way we, we I've, I learned a lot from that experience. I ended up doing six more parties and we ended up getting the radio station to um, support the parties. And the way we would do it is we would go to the radio stations and there was always one or two radio stations and we'd say, we're going to be running an underage nightclub party in the school holidays. Do you guys want to be the naming rights sponsor? You get to have it as your name sponsorship or do you, or should we go to the other radio yeah. station, right? <laughs> and they would always go, okay, yeah, well, what do you, you want? If you don't have the money, then we go to those <laughs> people. Yeah. Well, all I wanted was I, um, I wanted radio ads. So I said, can you give me the ads? Um, and they would give us five grand worth of ads. Then I would go to the nightclub and say, hey, we've secured $5,000 worth of free ads. If you give us the club, you get named as the top um, nightclub in town and you get f uh, five grand worth of free ads, you know, so we cover your costs and you get these ads. And mm. they were like, oh, okay, great. So then we'd go to the sponsors and we'd, you know, bring them in and, you know, Surf Skate Australia got involved and McDonald's got involved, and local council got involved. So we'd bring all these sponsors in together. And then essentially what would actually happen towards the end was the radio station would do all the promotion because they'd do the ads. The nightclub would run the thing and we would just stand at the door and take the money. And um, and that was that, happy days. That was pretty cool. Right? <laughs> that is crazy. So where did all this confidence come from? Because the average eighteen-year-old wouldn't be doing that, and they could be. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, totally, they could. Yeah, I think a, a little bit of stupidity, and just one step in one step in front of the ne one foot in front of the next foot. And I think the other thing that um, probably worked was um, just getting myself a little bit in too deep. So. Once we'd sort of committed to the venue, well, then we had no choice but to somehow figure out how to fill it. 
And once we'd figured out how to fill it, we then thought, oh, we, we need some sponsors. And then once we didn't like how much energy it took to, to fill the event, so what if we could get the radio station to do it? What would they want? And let's see if we can give them what they would want. Let's see if we can start juggling a few of these deals and then let's repeat and repeat. It's all, almost like leaving yourself no option. You're fully in, aren't you? Yeah. And you've got to make it work. There's no out clause at this stage. Well, the only out clause that I, and I do remember thinking this at the time, but I definitely think about it now, is that when you're 18, you really, like, if you screw it all up, like, so what? Mm. Like, it's no big deal. You tried to run a party and it didn't quite get full or you tried to do something and it didn't quite work. So, um, you know, I didn't have it. The, the beauty was I didn't have anything to lose. I had no reputation, no money, no nothing. So I had nothing to mm. lose, only things to gain. Uh, so from that point of view, it was um, was was great. And I was going to say as well, you uh, had six, six of these parties, right? Why yeah. didn't you just keep doing it? Because obviously it was working so well. What happened was um, there was a little bit of an overlap, but basically at the end of year one of university, so I was at university in Brisbane, at the end of year one, I had to evaluate, did I want to really do university? Um, there was two things that were happening for me. Number one, I couldn't really afford to be there. I was working bar jobs, door knocking, sales jobs. Um, I was uh, pizza delivery driving, and I still just couldn't afford to um, survive or live mm -hmm. properly, even though I was making this handfuls of cash. Very rapidly, you, you go through money pretty quickly. Yeah. I also got very frustrated that none of the university lecturers had actually started a business. So there was one of my university lecturers, and by the way, I'm doing an enterprise management course. Like it's, it was actually pitched as an entrepreneurial, um, small business entrepreneurial kind of course. And one guy, he says, oh yeah, I've, I've had a business. I teach kids swimming in my parents' pool. And we're like, well, how many kids? Oh, like I've got 12 kids that I teach and I'm like okay that's great and then another one was like oh I do some consulting or whatever that is okay great but it's like no one's got a business so we weren't getting any contact with people with business so when I went back um, at the end of the year I said this to my dad and I said look I, I you know I'm really frustrated and uh, I'm not enjoying it and it's it's difficult maybe I should just try and start a business or maybe I should do something like that and dad said I know a guy let me tee you up a meeting. This guy I know who he's run successful companies. He's 37 years old. He's going to be starting a new business. Why don't I see if I can get you a 30 minute meeting with him? See if you can have a, have a chat. So I drive up to this guy's house and I get to the house and it's stunning. This thing is a massive waterfront mansion and it's got this incredible, huge front door and, um, and I walk, like, I knock on the door and I walk walk in and I'm like, oh, like, where am I? It's These things are a huge imprint, aren't they, at that age? Because I've had similar experiences. Oh, it was a designer home. It was one mm. of these proper designer homes on the water, uh, millionaire kind of, like the sort of stuff you'd see in Miami and all yeah. this kind of stuff on the water. And I'm like, wow, like, whoever this guy is who opens the door, I have to work for him. So I go in this house and there's kids running around and there's this, it's like this river rock kind of like feature that goes around the corner and he's got this great office overlooking the pool and he's in his shorts and he's got his flip flops on and, and he, he's like, oh, tell me a bit about you. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, tell him about my nightclub party experience. And he asks all these questions about the nightclub parties and he's like, okay, you're a bit of a go-getter. So he says, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you come work for me? I'm going to start this company. And I say, well, what am I going to do? And he says, well, we'll get you on the phones and do some sales. Okay, great. Well, I, I don't really know much about that. He's like, that's all right. We'll teach you. We'll get, we'll get you there. And we end up having like a three or four hour chat. We talked about, you know, all sorts of things, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. I could just tell there was going to be a great relationship there. So I quit and I, I started working for John. Did, um, did you have any like reservations about like starting, like, instead of starting your own business, like working for someone else? This just seemed so right. You know, I, I, I got it straight away. If this guy's under 40 with this house and, you know, his, his office was full of business books and he just had a way about him that he just, I, I just knew he knew so much more than and I And you were going to learn loads, obviously. Oh, I, I knew. Oh, the other thing too is he, he said, you'll, you'll make great money. Like um, I remember him asking me the question. He said, how much do you think is a lot of money? And I said, uh, I said 52000 a year. I said, if you can make a grand a week, there's nothing you can't do. If you, if you, and this is Aussie dollars, right? This is 22 years ago, but um, there's nothing you can't do on a grand a week. And he says, well, I'll tell you some good news and some bad news. <laughs> he said, if you're only making a grand a week, I'll fire you. <laughs> I 
I said, what? He said, well, you're going to have to be making more than $10,000. You're going to be on 10% commission. You're going to have to make more than 10 grand's worth of sales in a week. Um, so if you, you know, I want you making more like 20, 30 grand worth of sales. I'm like, what, I'm going to make two, three grand a week. And he's like, yeah, if you hit your targets. It, and I'm like, okay, like, you know, that, that was crazy. Right. So yeah. do, do you feel like that money mindset hurdle is, is very hard for a lot of entrepreneurs to get over in the early stages? Do you, do you know how he handled it? So what he did is he insisted on me carrying, I think it was a thousand dollars because I thought a thousand dollars was so much money. He insisted on me carrying a thousand dollars. Sounds a bit dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Right. So he got this clip and he said, he, he, he said, have you still got some of the money from the parties, the nightclub parties? So I had some little bit of cash and um, I borrowed some and I got some off the credit card and I've had a thousand dollars. One of the activities that he gave me, but he said, I want you to carry, bring ten hundred dollar notes. I want you to carry this thousand dollars because he, he said, I, I need you to think of a thousand dollars as pocket money. You just got to have it in your pocket. Nothing. Right. And that that's a smart way to look at it, to be fair. It would have been cooler if he gave you the grand. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's nothing to me. So there you go. It's not quite the same, though, is it? Uh, it You've got to cool. go and get it. And I guess you had to turn up with it as well. I had to turn up with it. Um, had he given it to me, I would have felt like I was looking after his money. Mm. Um, but this felt dangerous. Like this was my this was my entire net worth uh, in my pocket. Um, and it was just like and all the stuff comes up to the surface. Like, will I get attacked? Um, will I lose it? And essentially, that is your money stuff. That is your that is your limiting beliefs around money. You think um, if I have money, people will judge me. If I have money, people will attack me. If I have money, um, uh, I, I'll be irresponsible with it. I'll buy something I don't need. If I have money, I'll lose it. I'm you know it'll just go away. So all these things come bubbling up to the surface. And he encouraged me to journal. So he said, whatever you feel about holding on to that money, just write it down and then just think about it. Do you want to think? Do you want to continue to feel that way? So he was a great mentor. Like all of these, he all, always had a challenge for me, always set some sort of a weird thing um, that I had to do. I was, I was not allowed to watch any news. I wasn't allowed to. Um, uh, you don't watch the news, do you? No, don't? I hate watching the news. I find it so depressing. It. There's nothing on there of any relevance to me. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't care for it. I can't do anything about it. It's going to yeah. happen anyway, or it has happened. We're looking forward and we're trying to do stuff that we want to do. So that was word for word what he said. <laughs> okay. Exactly what he said. Exactly that. And this was around the time of 9 11. So all the news was just about terrorism and how, you know, there's going to be terror attacks and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, he's like, Dan, we live in, we live in the beachside in Australia. Like this is not, <laughs> this is not worth your time or focus. So, um, so essentially, um, yeah. We, How about in terms of like financial news and recession? Because maybe there is something to knowing about those kind of things. No, he said, so great question. And he said, um, you've got no money, so don't worry about what the market's doing. <laughs> You're not invested in anything. Mm. Um, and he said, um, uh, if there's a recession, that'll be a great opportunity. That's where money's made. So, um, so I'll let you know if that happens, but we're going to, and there had actually just been, the crash from 9-11 and also the dot-com bubble had burst. So yeah. all of those things had happened around that time. So Big events. I think we were actually in shitty finance, financial times. Yeah, I think that's the best time to start up in a business, yeah. really do. I mean, I, my my business um, journey started with uh, the, dep the, not the depression, sorry, the recession of I think it was not the early 90s, 92. late 80s. Yeah. And, um, you know, people kept saying to me, what, well, you're doing this in a recession? Mm. I went, well, I don't even know what a recession is, but I'm doing what I'm doing. That's, yeah. that's all there is to it. And what you take and how well you do, you just think, well, that's how how, how well I can do. Yeah. It's not relevant to having taken 5,000 a week previous and mm. now you're down to two. You're taking what you're doing. So I suppose when you come out as well, it's like supercharged. Yeah, it, it's it so is. much easier yeah. when you're not even, in that recession. Even during the recession. So if there's a recession, here's, here's a couple of things that happen. So in the lead up to a recession, big companies have figured everything out and they're, imagine they've got these cookie jars and they have just put all the cookies in the cookie jar and they are guarding that cookie jar and they have figured out how to advertise, how to do sales, how to do the leads, how to do this, how to do that. And all the cookies are going back into their cookie jar. When that recession comes along, it's like they shake up that cookie jar, all the crumbs get spilt everywhere and big companies actually just drop everything but their core business. So they will say, oh, that's not, you know, in the lead up to the recession, they'll be like, oh, we're going to 
do some events and we're going to sponsor these things and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to throw money all over the place and getting their fingers into all sorts of pies. As soon as there's a recession, they pull out of all of that non-core business. They'll happily leave $10 million opportunities on the table because they're protecting their core business. Um, also, they hoover up all the talent. So all the all the people are working for these big companies. In a recession, they stop hiring so there's suddenly there's people around that you can work with and collaborate with. Had I not been, had I not graduated around that time, I might have actually been offered a big job at a big corporate, but that wasn't happening at that particular moment either. So, um, so that that happens. The other thing that happens is that they have once pre-recession, there's really high lifetime value of a client. There's really um, that leads to high acceptable cost per acquisition. That leads to high acceptable lead cost, which basically means they become lazy in how they're going to generate business and, yeah. and all of that. When the recession stops, none of those numbers make sense anymore. So they freeze and they sort of dial it all back. But it basically means that a small startup business can go into an opportunity, pick up the phone and talk to people, which a big company would never do, and just say, hey, we can do this. And a small business can normally offer something at 30% less than a big business and it, and make the same profit. So the opportunity opens up. You know, the recession, when the news reports on a recession, they're reporting through the lens of the main traditional economy, the FTSE 100s and all of that sort of stuff. That's what they're reporting on. Oil companies have lost 3%, you know, worth mm. of billions and blah, blah, blah. But they're not. It's almost the opposite for the entrepreneurs. Yeah, I love the thinking like those big companies have lost their power in a way and the smaller companies have had a chance to like break into the market. And they can change direction quickly, can't you, as a small business? Yeah, you're like a jet ski. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're a jet yeah, ski. Not they're an oil big, tanker. You're a big, they're yeah. a big oil tanker and you're yeah. a jet ski. And if you imagine things have fallen off the sides and you're that jet ski, you just go pick it up. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So all of these things your mentor got you to do, how did that actually help in your sales position? Well, carrying cash, for example, that really did help because I was learning sales at the time and I was learning marketing and sales. And I think, by the way, I think that's one of the best things everyone should learn, how to do sales, how to do marketing. Um, I was going through a process of understanding how to um, generate leads, turn leads into appointments, appointments into presentations and presentations into sales. So we call this LAPS, leads, appointments, presentation, sales. And when it would come time to ask for the money at the end of the sale, I initially felt that asking for money was so, such a big deal. Like all of my nonverbal communication was along the lines of asking someone for a kidney or something like that, right? It was just, it was an unthinkable ask. And then once I started carrying a grand, two grand in my pocket, my nonverbal communication towards money really shifted. Asking for money was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, and it'll be, you know, and that'll be a couple of grand. So that's what it costs. Yeah, that's what it costs. It just I had no emotion around it or a mm. lot less emotion. And it just didn't give off a vibe of like this is really expensive because as a salesperson you don't want to give off the vibe of like, oh, this thing that I'm asking for is unreasonable. And people pick up on that. So um, so that that shifted pretty quickly. I did actually start making a lot of sales. I made about 100 grand a month worth of sales and I was making 10 grand to 12 grand a month on a, on a typical month as a 19, 20. 20 so a lot more than you said initially that mm. would uh, be, allow you to do whatever you wanted. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The grand, there's not much you can't do on a grand a week. I discovered things like taxes though and I discovered things like how, how quickly you can up your uh, expenses. How would you use this money? How, how did I? Yeah, like how would you use it when you were 19 making 12 grand a month back then? <laughs> well, I did all the stuff that you would imagine. I bought a much nicer car. Um, Lifestyle inflation hits. Uh -huh. uh, I love that. I, I, got a, um, I got a girlfriend and uh, she said it would be really cool for us to move into a beachside apartment. So we moved into a really trendy apartment. Um, and like so fast, like mm. the speed at which you up your expense. I started eating out at restaurants all the time and... Um, you know, I went from like walking around and going to the butcher and getting, you know, five dollars worth of meat, which was a whole bag that I could turn into soup. A year later, I'm like out at a restaurant every night. Looking and back at that, do you think that's a mistake or did you have to go through it? No, it wasn't a mistake your... at all. It was it was great. Like I was 19, 20 years old. I'm making all this money. I've got a nice car. I've got a nice apartment. I'm eating at restaurants. I'm, I'm hanging out with cool people. Um, like you only get to be that age once. But you probably still had a lot of money left over as well, though. Not a lot. I blew it. I blew a lot of it. Like oh, really? initially, yeah. You're I, going that crazy. It sounds a lot more like you than me. But. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I was. I love that. Uh, yeah, I. 
you know, look, I did do, I, I did some stupid stuff. I had some, I had some money saved up and I heard about stock market trading, day trading. So I start day trading and I go through four grand like that. I remember like the speed at which I went through $4,000 and, and like, how did I, like, this was meant to be a surefire thing. I, I did the technical analysis. I, I <laughs> there was a candlestick and it said that it was this. Mm. And now I'm it's like. It's all like voodoo, isn't it? It's, oh, oh is, and then is like. Is it true, is it not? I don't know. My, more, my boss says, like, <laughs> my boss says to me, how many points would you score in the NBA if you were a basketballer? Like, how many points, if you were, if I put you on the court and you're up against the best basketballers, how many points do you think you'd score? I'm like, none. He's like, well, you're up against the best traders in the world. You're not going to score any points on those guys. They're going to take your money. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. So I stopped that pretty quickly. Um, so basically, I went through I went through that experience. Um, forex trading at the time was the equivalent of um, crypto now, right? So that it was the it was the cool thing to do. It was the everyone was trying to trying to do that. Um, yeah. So I I tried some investing and and there was bits and bobs, but ultimately I was. I, I saved a little bit of money, which I then ended up using to start a business at 21. So but between those two points, like when did you feel like just being a salesperson wasn't enough and you wanted to move into starting your own business? Mm. Why would you leave? What's the catalyst? Yeah, it sounds that? like it's so good. Because um, not many people would month, leave a 12 grand a month Very comfortable, job. yeah. Yeah, so... You're in the comfort zone. So year, very one, year one was sales um and i was like loving sales and i was learning so much sales is also personal development you learn so much about yourself and your psychology and you come out of your shell and you learn communication skills and you learn human psychology and buying psychology so it's it, it is it's a psych degree and a communications course it's all of that wrapped into one just getting on the phones talking to people trying to trying to get them to part with money trying to get them to make a decision on something so the ability to build rapport and you know, ask questions and identify opportunities. All of that sort of stuff is is incredible and sales is great. But I still had my heart set on being an entrepreneur. And in at the end of year one, I went to John and I said, we're doing um, all of this stuff in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. I've identified that there are these opportunities in what you'd call B cities. So the in Australia, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne are your A cities. And then there was we could do something in Cairns, which is up north. We could do something in Geelong, which is out of Melbourne. We could do something in Hobart, um, which is the capital of Tasmania. So I'm like, there's these opportunities where there's quite a high population and then there's these newspapers and they the ads are really cheap. Like what we would spend seven grand on for a quarter page ad in, in the big um, cities, these will do it for like a grand to 1500. And I'm pretty sure no one goes there and we could go there and we could we could do stuff. So John says, well, you know, let's, uh, you know, why don't you test it out? I'll give you a testing budget and you can, you can do this. So I, what was cool? I was 20 and he was like letting me do this. So he gives me a credit card and he basically says, go, go launch in these three um, B cities if you think it's a good idea. So I took on this opportunity to run this um, secondary business. His business, the core business was ex exploding. They were doing so well. We went from zero to like six million in the first year. Um, 60 people in an inner city Melbourne office at the end of year one. Um, we, we we had a great sales manager and a, build, a growing sales team. And there was all these new sales people joining the team. And it was very competitive in the sales team. So I wanted to kind of front run into the next thing. I'd been there under John's wing. I wanted to stay under John's wing. And I went and started this side business. And we did 700 grand worth of revenue in the first year. And it was really profitable, like quarter of a million dollars worth of profit. Um, and the, for, for context, the main business did 6 million worth of revenue, but it didn't make a lot of profit. It was actually just all going back into the machine. I'd run a really profitable little division and I was super stoked because I basically, my PL looked really good. It was small, but it was profitable. Um, and I, and I'd validated that the idea was a good idea. So, um, at the end of year two, I go to John and I say, um, Hey John, you know, I've done this side business and I've done this and I, you know, I was right there at the beginning. I, I want to become a shareholder. I want to you know, get some shares in the business. And I, he's packing his box. We're both put, putting boxes in the back of the car and he's, he goes, Dan, if you want to have shares in a business, go start your own business. <laughs> <laughs> so he was just not having it. I, I definitely not picked my moment. Was he not worried about losing someone so integral to the company though? I just think he, he, if I was him, and I'm probably close in age to how, how old he was at the time, if I was him, I would think, why on earth would you leave? Like I was on, on, I was on a good wicket and I was learning a lot and all this sort of stuff. 
I think he was just swatting me back. So he thought he had all the cards. Yeah. You wouldn't take that jump. Yeah, of course. Like, why would I, why would I do that? It's like, you know, he, but he was just kind of like, you know, flippantly going, mate, if you want shares in a business, go start your own business. This is my business. Um, And also I think he, I, I can empathize now and I would say he was giving me so much value in, in the form of learning and education that, to want shares on top was a little bit cheeky. And I suppose um, he was taking the risk as well. He did kind of, he trusted you, but he gave you his money to yeah. go and start up all of these different it, side businesses. It, could he have not given you shares in the smaller business that you'd started? Yeah, we could have done that. Could have split it off. I think that yeah. would have been more likely. Yeah. So thinking back to it, yeah, all of that could have happened. And also on me, because let's not, let's not take the, like John, you know, John, I don't know what was going on through his head, but I know what was going, what, what I can learn from that is I should never have been pitching a big idea like having shares in a company uh, while we're packing boxes in No, the car, timing is everything, right? isn't it? I, if I wanted shares in that company, I should have put together a presentation, thought it through from his point of view, what performance targets am I committing to, what risk am I willing to take? Like I should have really put that onto a slide deck and presented it to him at the right time. I should have set an appointment with him and got his full attention and actually done a financial forecast and, and put it to him, not, not like a brat go and ask him, hey, I want some shares in the company, right? So Why do you think you didn't think it through like that? And were you nervous? 20. Before, were you nervous about asking in that moment? No, and it kind of just came no, out? It was or? entitlement. I was just entitled. Right. I was an entitled brat. Um, I just thought I'd hit a little home run, right? And in my mind, two years worth of commitment was a huge deal because at eight, 18, 19, 20, you think of two years as like yeah. a long Well, it's a big time. percentage of your life back then, isn't yeah. it? Exactly. Yeah. But for John, like, you know, I'd been an okay salesperson, one of many, um, because the sales team was like 15, 20 people at that time. And I'd also done this, this thing that represented a small percentage of revenue, but he, he had plenty of other things that were happening. So how soon after that conversation did you actually physically leave? So two things happened. That conversation happened and it was around, I think it was around Christmas time or something. And he gave me a bonus in an envelope and it was five hundred dollars. Now I'd just made quarter of a million dollars, so it's a bit insulting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now he hadn't really thought it through. He had this new CFO, who everyone hated, and she was really reining in profitability. And basically, it was five hundred dollars above and beyond what we had agreed, but it, it was still five hundred bucks. Yeah, you're better off not to give it. Just say there's no bonuses this year because whatever, but 500 is an insult. It was, it was a little bit like, so the two things combined, what I did with the $500 is I put it behind the bar um, at the local bar that we used to go to. And I just invited a bunch of people and we all had drinks. We all got blind drunk. And then I woke up really hungover. And in my hungover state, I went, Fuck it, I'm, I am going to go. I'm going to quit. All right. Um, I just imagine any... everyone cheering you on. Like, I'm yeah. gonna do it. I'm yeah. gonna do it. Did you have any safety net at this time? Like, did you have any savings? No, I had very limited savings, and I had um, a car loan. I'd, I'd, I'd taken out a loan for twenty grand from a car, and I'd um, I had an inner city Melbourne apartment that I was living in opposite Crown Casino. Um, so, like, wow, yeah. Um, I I did have the only safety net I did have is I had a twenty thousand dollar credit card. Because I'd been traveling around doing these events, I'd been putting all the expenses on my credit card and then when I'd get back to the office, I'd hand in all my receipts and then they'd clear my credit card. So this gave me a very good credit rating. Um, and um, at the time, the uh, American Express had just upped my limit. So I was this 21-year-old who had a uh, $20,000 credit card limit, um, which was pretty cool. Mm. So I had a credit card, but that was a 55-day thing. You had... If you timed it right, you had a, a total of 55 days to, to actually pay back the full balance. You had to pay it all back or else you're on huge, crazy penalties and fro- cards frozen. Pretty sure it's still like that to this day as well, isn't it? Mm. With yeah, I, I think ours is a charge card. Yeah, so, so it's mine, it's yeah. 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 So basically the plan was that I would stick a $7,000 ad on my credit card and I would generate enough leads that I would be able to hit the phones, make sales, and then make enough sales to pay back the credit card all within the 55 days. All right, so that was going to be... So what, so what was the business that you yeah, actually what started? Are you selling? And, yeah, what was the leads for? Yeah, so um, basically the <laughs> it's, a, it's a complicated business model, but essentially it's performance marketing agency. And the performance marketing agency that John was running was um, partner with companies that have a core business and bolt onto the front of their business a lead generation strategy, which was called an introduction event. So the introduction event was... 
think about it like this. The, the, the way that you would generate a lead for most businesses is either get people to attend an event um, set up a group and people can join a group, although that wasn't really a thing at the time, but like a WhatsApp group or a Facebook group or something like that, um, or get them to fill in a scorecard or a quiz or um, put their details in for a prize. Mm. So these are like the classic lead generation strategies. Now, most businesses, they, they get to a point where they're very focused on their core business. They're technically strong on their core business, but then they lose like their marketing. You know, they end up doing branded marketing and all these kind of things. And then they kind of, you know, they're looking for performance marketing without taking their eye off the ball of the core business. So what John's model was is to strap uh, the introduction event onto the front end and then partner with the revenue that came off the back. So if we can if we can take a good, strong core business and then generate a ton of leads and make the sales, then we're going to get a bunch of money. Uh, they're going to make a bunch of money and we're going to make a bunch of money. So what would be an example of one of those businesses and events? So a financial planning company. Um, that has, uh, let's say they've got 20 employees and they've got millions of you know, big offices and they bring people in and they've got their financial planning um, company and they've kind of just gotten a bit lazy in the way that they promote and market and we would strap onto the front end something like an introduction to financial planning or an introduction to markets. So a free event or something free like event. that. Yeah. Come along. Come along, free Doesn't event. Doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. But you get their details. And we'd put an expert speaker on stage and they would explain some key concepts. And then from there, uh, there's a diary up the back of the room and people then book in with a financial planner. Um, and, you know, we would basically get uh, performance marketing fees for all of that sort of stuff. So we did this with financial planners, did it with um, the big one that I ended up doing was a franchise. So there was a franchise that had been going for a few years. They'd, I think they were up to about 40 franchisees. They were exhibiting at the franchise show. I saw the presentation. The, the CEO uh, had one of those side booths. You know how they have those little side things at the yeah. show? He had one of those. I sat in on the presentation, great presentation, looked interesting. Um, and I said to the CEO, you're in competition with 300 other franchises here. Um, you need to be doing this presentation where people aren't seeing 25 other things that day. Why don't you do introduction events separate to the franchise show. Never never thought of that. We just exhibit at the franchise show. And I said, I will take on the contract to exhibit you at um, without the franchise show. We will just do introduction events in Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. Um, but we get a percentage of every franchise fee. We get a, um, a retainer um, to cover our basic costs. Mm. <clears throat> so this worked really well. We scaled up. So with the, the events, you take on all of the costs of running that event yourself yes. so it's, it's a no-brainer for the company then to work with you it's exactly right so a typical event would be spend seven thousand on an ad and about a hundred people book 60 to 70 people show up as a at, at a free event um, and then our job is to book appointments into their diary so there are a lot of businesses that are sales focused businesses and there, there are a lot of businesses that are kind of um brand or channel focused businesses. So if you're selling something cheap, um, you know, like let's say you're a restaurant or a meal, you don't need a sales team um, selling mm. tables. But yeah, if you're anything you're selling <clears throat> under the perceived value, yeah. it's quite simple, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. But if you're if once you go over a threshold of a, say a thousand dollars or a couple of thousand pounds and it's a it's what's called a considered purchase, then those businesses run on something called laps. So laps means leads, appointments, presentations, sales. So essentially, take a financial planning business. Can we generate a lead? Can we turn a lead into an appointment? Can we present and, and present how our solution works? And will they then buy it? And essentially, that's the pipeline. Um, and this is the true for all sorts of businesses like franchises, um, uh, even big businesses like Goldman Sachs. When they're doing an IPO, they are contacting the, the, you hear these kind of people young people who work at Goldman Sachs what they will actually be doing day to day is picking up the phone and calling through high net worth individuals pension funds family offices booking appointments so they have a lead book these are all of our leads they will then book an appointment for the CEO to go and present and then the CEO flies out and presents and then they commit to supporting the IPO with a certain amount of money and they just go through this lapse, leads, appointments, presentation, sales, and that's how, they're, that's how they're doing it. So essentially there are sales-driven businesses and 
you've kind of, the tricky thing is you've kind of got to get good at all those steps. So if you imagine you're a financial planning business or a franchise, you're really, most of your focus is actually on running a good business. You're trying to have a good product. You're trying to like systemize how everything works and you get busy with your clients. You get very, very rapidly, if you're successful, you get busy looking after the people that you've already sold to. So you take your eye off the ball of lead generation and then you take your eye off the ball of appointment setting and then you take your eye off the ball of pre presenting. And, and you just survive in as a business at that stage. Yeah, aren't it's, you? It's, it's, not growing. it's like a little bit like a YouTube channel yeah. in a way. Like you can make the best content, but then you might take your eye off the ball of the thumbnails and titles and yeah. you're not like generating the leads to and come the, in and watch the videos. And there's the weakest link. Mm. Now, also, if you think about a YouTube channel, let's say I was... Uh, cheeky and I came to you guys and I said look you're you're busy focused on your YouTube channel um, I bet that you could get a lot more sponsorships why don't you do more sponsor de sponsor deals and you're this like is Kai's <laughs> <laughs> so you, it's a whole other side of the business which is identify a long list of leads who might be sponsored who might sponsor book appointments with them present to them our numbers and what we have to offer and then close the deal so that's the whole lapse side of things yeah so this is something we recently actually did we have a content side of the team now and a money side money and, and side. kai leads up the money side there you go so he's closing deals you know has leads and all of that laps, stuff. yeah laps, laps. i've never considered it like that though mm. but yeah that's exactly what i do yeah exactly down to a t so so and you wear the thousand pound jeans instead of the thousand pounds in your pocket yeah. <laughs> there, there, there you go someone's going to come along and steal the jeans hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. um so yeah so what we were doing is we were the laps engine that was the business we mm. essentially it's and it's also referred to as performance marketing. So the alternative is the bullshit marketing of branding and all this kind of awareness and all this kind of stuff you can't measure, the fuzzy stuff that they love up in corporate so that nobody gets fired, you know. Um, and the dirty end of marketing is performance marketing where we measure everything. And it's like cost per lead, cost per acquisition, cost per appointment. And it's like we, we test headline A versus headline B. Can that bring down the cost by 5%? So essentially what my company did was we were just testing A, A versus B ads, um, you know, booking systems. Does a one is a is it worth having a free call number? Um, is it worth is a Tuesday night event better performer than a Wednesday night? Um, is it better to start at seven thirty or seven o'clock? Like everything we tested. You think brand lift campaigns are a waste of time then? Because that's the kind of thing we would like uh, to sponsor the podcast. Because in in a way then we can represent that brand and tie that to our identity and mm. lift them that way. And we're but, quite fussy about our sponsors as yeah. well, yeah. to be honest. They've really got to fit, fit our the, ethos. Fit the brand. Yeah. Yeah. Like it to feels be a, a bit salesy as well. Like click the link in the description, like mm -hmm. again and again, different thing yeah. every week, you know? So is there something to brand lift or not there, in your opinion? There, there, there comes a point where a business becomes so big that branding is everything. Um, so... Like, you know, you get to BMW size and you get to Goldman Sachs and all this sort of stuff. The really, Rolex as well. Yeah, Ro sort of Coca-Cola. Coca yeah, exactly. So I think that's Gymshark what, is probably getting there as mm, well. Yeah, they're getting yeah. to that point. But if you really want to drive growth, and by the way, I will say this, a lot of those big brands, quite secretly, they're very performance focused underneath the brand. So, for example, Rolex, you can't sell a Rolex unless you've done Rolex Bootcamp. Rolex Bootcamp is three days worth of product knowledge and sales training. And then you have to learn how to talk to customers and you have to learn the scripts and you have to keep track of your numbers and all those sorts of things. It's a delicate balance with Rolex. Of and then they still won't sell you anyway. <laughs> they still, that's part of the magic, yeah, right? Yeah. They've figured it all out. But still, they do have leads, appointments, presentations and sales or something to the equivalent. Um, you know, the big brands like BMW, they will have a more performance end of their measuring, but they, they provide cloud cover with brand. So it's that opens the door. It's the awareness level. It's, it's kind of like, you know, makes everything run a little bit smoother. So what we were doing was, was just basically finding companies that were good companies that had a good product and service, but they'd taken their eye off the ball with the laps and we come in and we, uh, pitch them a deal where we get a percentage of all the additional revenue that we can bring in, but we take all the risk. And uh, So did you start the exact same company as your mentor? Very similar. <laughs> very it's a smart thing to do, <laughs> isn't it? You know, so how a, much money was it making, you know, early doors, should we say? And how many people did you have? So I started with uh, myself and two others. Um, I, I was the owner, but I brought in uh, a salesperson and what I call a Swiss Army knife. Did they ask for shares? 
<laughs> yeah. Imagine want, you said if the they want shares, thing. they can go start, <laughs> start their own business. Uh, they did ask. One did ask for shares, and he um, and I said to him, "You can have shares, but you can't have a high commission. You can have either a high commission mm. or shares, but you can't have both." Um, I said, "I'm only gonna be. I'm gonna be eating last. I'll be, you know, taking money out of profit. Yeah. So if you want to be an owner, then you have to be on that side of things." So I gave him the choice, mm. and he said, "No, I want money. Like I want. I want to. I, I want money off top line, not bottom line." So was it immediately successful? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So first campaign, um, we we made about thirty five thousand um, dollars in our fees. So seven thousand dollars turned into thirty five thousand in about ten days, and um, and then I ran that same campaign forty three times with that same company, um, and in I think it was. <sighs> It was like it all came out. Whatever we were doing, it came out at about one point three million with four hundred thousand profit in year one. So that was pretty cool, mm. right? At twenty one, twenty two, mm. um, and then we just really ramped it up. And by year three, we were doing year three or four. We were doing ten point about a million a month. Um, in yeah. so did this just continue on that trajectory, or was there a few bumps in the road? <clears throat> no. So twenty four, twenty five. Um, I've bought like the brand new Beamer and I've got the big house and I've got all like now I'm really living large. Um, yeah, so having a lot of fun. And like you say, going to all these different events, it's like your life is fun anyway. And yeah. then you're buying all the cool stuff as well. Yeah, we had we did 174 events in in that um, in this final year with an average of like two, three hundred people per event. It was it was a, a wild. If That's Instagram was, events, back, was, was around back then, that would have been crazy. Just all the different pictures. It was different intense. Locations. Yeah, it was really, mm. really wild, really intense. So then what happened is that this company that was a franchise, they were going to float. They, we, we drove so many sales to them that they were going to float on the stock market and they started getting ready for a float. And the CEO came to me and he says, um, he says we want to roll you in. What does that mean? Okay, we, we want to negotiate with you that we're going to, you're a big part of our success, so we need to roll you in. You need to have shares in the float. And I remember it was around $14 million that I was going to get in the, in the float that basically. And you didn't even know what it was? Well, no, I was just head down marketing and all That's this crazy. Sort of stuff. But, <laughs> but but it was they were gonna basically they're gonna float for two hundred million and we we're gonna get seven percent of the company um, to to roll in um, and um, that was the that was the deal. So we were at that point of like talking through like all of this and really learning about what does it mean and we were flying back and forwards with different lawyers and understanding what floating meant and all this sort of stuff and how do we actually get money out because it wasn't necessarily a cash out it was like shares and they were going to be locked up for a period of time and all this sort of stuff so this is all happening and right up on on christmas ish uh he he says come over to perth which is a six hour flight right before christmas two days before christmas and um, bring Glenn. And I'm thinking, okay, we've had a big year together. This is going to be great. And um, obviously they're there to, you know, do, they're there to look after us in some way and welcome, welcome into the family type thing. So he, he'd been vague about why he wanted us to be there, but it sounded like, okay, cool. And I said, I'd even said, like, do you, do you need us there? Like, we've had a big year. I really just want to chill out for Christmas and spend time with family. And he was like, no, no, you want to come across. So I fly across to uh, to Perth, six hours, and we we turn up to the foyer, and he leaves us sitting in the foyer for eight hours while they're having a board meeting, and they they're having a board meeting in there, and we're sitting in the foyer for eight hours. We've just stepped off a six hour flight, and we're now sitting around for eight hours. And it's crazy they can have a meeting for eight hours as well. Yeah, these people must be insane. <laughs> yeah, and I mean this is also in the in the lead up to float, yeah. right? So there's a lot to lot to talk about for whatever for whatever reason, and. They hadn't really said this is what's happening or any of that sort of stuff. It's just ha hang out, and, and we'd sort of said, you know, can we go get lunch? Like, when are you when are you planning on? Oh, we'll, we'll be we'll be a little while. Don't go too far. So we get we really get frustrated, right? So we're now pissed off, and we get talking and we go, fuck these guys. We're not going to do this. We're not, we're, we're not we're not involved with this, and we don't think they're. You, we we think we've actually. We, we actually think we've done as much as we can do for them. I don't think we can keep growing like this. I think they can't train this many franchisees. Um, I think they're, they're taking on the wrong types of franchisees. They're not doing delivering the training as well as they said. They're getting people who are not perfect, good fit. And also, like we've, we've just ramped them up this much. Can we, do the, can we do that again? Do we want to do that again? And if they're looking for even more growth, how much pressure are they going to put on us to like – do it all again and then it's going to start breaking at the seams 
So we just start talking ourselves out of the deal. And by and the time, how much I, of that do you think was ego? Are like, you impulsive like that? Sorry to cut you off, because um, like leaving the leaving the last business, well, just deciding yeah. fuck these guys. Well, like the only truth is the result, and at that time, yeah, I mean, uh, very different now, but it had been a one hell of a. I was very cocky, right? I hadn't had. I hadn't had a punch in the face. So would you say it was ego, like Curtis said? Probably a little yeah, bit. I'd of, say if, if you're making like a million to, a to month. Be, to be fair, I don't think that mine would felt, be off the charts. Yeah, <laughs> it would be. <laughs> it's already <laughs> off the charts. Yeah. And that was that was revenue. That was top line was a million a month. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was making a lot of money, and I, and not only was I making a lot of money, I was living a crazy life. Mm. We were always staying in the best hotels. Um, you know, we, like it was just it was just nonstop. What, like every single day was something amazing. Like great restaurants, great parties, great this, great that, running events, doing this, money coming in. And it was always, and it was spread across multiple cities. So we would check, like check out and then we would just fly down to Melbourne and do it all again. And then we'd fly back to Sydney and do it all again. And then fly back up to Brisbane and do it all again. And so it was just this, it was this kind of, it, it was a bit like a movie. Like I remember watching the movie Entourage and it was, Kind of like there were elements of that where we were just all moving together as a pack. Um, so you pulled yourself out of this deal. We yeah. go into the meeting and they're like, "Oh, sorry," and oh, um, so disrespectful. And it? Glenn slams his hand on the on the desk and goes, "Bang, bang, 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 bang!" He goes, "We've never been so disrespected. We've made you guys so many millions this year." Blah, blah, blah. He goes, "We're done. We're out of the deal. We've decided." And and um, we'd talked about this, but I was like, oh shit, are we? <laughs> He's actually doing it. <laughs> He's doing it. He's actually saying it. Um, and mind, mind you, he wasn't actually a shareholder at yeah. this point. Yeah. It was my shares. Uh, I was like, oh, okay. So it was easy for him 14, to make that decision. $14 but, million. Oh. Dollars. Yeah, we, we, we behaved as partners, but yeah, at the moment I remember thinking, oh, okay, we're walking away from $14 million here. Um, anyway, so um, we basically said we're, we're not going to do it. We're, what we're did up. they want? Like, why were you there? Why were they taking so long? What would have happened if you didn't say that? You still don't know. No. And no. did they eventually we float up, even without up. you? They did float. Don't and tell me 300 million or no, something dark they floated, like that. They floated for 200 million. And um, we had been their driving force. We had driven all of those sales. We'd, be, we'd, been, the, we'd been the electricity mm. that they ran on. And we'd given them the numbers that they were extrapolating forward. And when we disappeared... They tried all sorts of other ways. They floated about a year later, right? So it wasn't a quick thing. They were yeah. ge they were gearing up for this, um, and then they just tanked. Yeah, they just tanked. So um, now I don't think they would have tanked if we had a, if they had a treated us right. We we could have been enrolled. We could have been back on board. We were young guns. We mm. were a team of sales performance marketers, and we drove numbers. And we were very aggressive in like quarterly performance. We would have been great with quarterly performance and they just couldn't hit their numbers anymore so they they, they tanked um, so what happened to your business if they're now longer no, no longer a client yeah so we're going through a lot of stories and these are well, long, long before we get onto that what was their reaction when you said yeah. that because we didn't hear that did they try stop you yeah they were like well you can't what are you gonna you, you guys have built you've built your business around us you know you're you're we're you know we're, we're in bed we're in bed together so you they can't. were your biggest client yeah mm. yeah they were they were <clears throat> They were eighty percent of our revenue, yeah. Um, at that point, so we had other clients, but they were the big client, and um, yeah, I, they were just like, "Well, you, you, what are you guys going to do?" And we're like, well, "We're twenty four. We've got no overheads. We uh, happily sleep on a mattress on the floor. Fuck off." Mm. Um, so we were we were cheeky, and we just said, "We're not going to be disrespected. If we're going to be in a relationship where you guys just disrespect us like that, we're not we're not doing it." So we were just, whether it was ego or principle or just it didn't feel right. For whatever reason, we trusted our guts and we 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 trusted our abilities. Have you ever let a, a client get to eighty percent of your revenue again? No, after that? <laughs> no. Uh, I'm I'm the opposite now. I've now got eight different companies, three time zones. Um, uh, we've got companies that sell to corporate and to startups. So like very diversified now. <laughs> yeah, someone said to me quite a few years ago, you never want any one client to be more than really forty nine percent of your business. Mm. Ideally, no more than twenty mm, if you can mm. do it, um, because obviously if they fall off, mm. you're you're in trouble. Yeah, when you sell your company, they always ask like, "What concentration 
is the you know the quality of earnings report mm. you know what what quali- concentration so i mean we were a disaster in that respect mm. mine's currently 19 percent because i've just done the the maths funnily enough yeah. so uh, i'm quite happy with that yeah 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 exactly it's nice to have an anchor client mm. like a, a 20 like 19 percent as your yeah. anchor client we've got a then, couple around that sort of area then they all tail yeah, off as, yeah. as normal so yeah, it's quite nice. So did you go back to sleeping on mattresses then after this, this big client was dropped? No, very rapidly. Here's the thing. We we were very good at what we were doing and everyone knew we were, we were great at what we were doing. Everyone could see the, the what, what we're up to. So very rapidly, um, I had a mentor, Paul, who said, hey, I think I've got your next client. I've got your next thing. Um, I've got a guy who wants to launch in London. Have you ever been to London? No, let's let's do that. Let's try. <laughs> let's just do it. <laughs> That's quite a thing, uprooting. You've got to have a lot of courage to uproot from Australia to come to London. It's not a short trip. Yeah, it's not a short trip. <laughs> it's more than six hours. <laughs> it's, a, it's it's more than six hours, 24 hours on a plane. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I arrived in London with nothing but a suitcase and a credit card. Um, Glenn and my other uh, guys stayed and kind of worked with their smaller clients and kind of built them up a little bit and we were doing a bit of bit of both i came to launch london and um, i set myself a challenge to relaunch on a credit card again so 2006 i rock up i got a suitcase and a credit card and i've never been above the equator so i i turn up and i have no idea what to expect um and then a year later we had four million of re- four million pounds of revenue um so four million pounds year one from a standing start with a credit card suitcase no no knowledge of anything so um, this is all uphill trajectory all the way at the moment really even with uh saying fuck you to the uh oh mark's war well, again to the uh <laughs> to, well, to the clients it's more like waves isn't it so you're going uh, all the way back down to it, well, it didn't zero f- it didn't feel like uphill like it, it felt like we it, it was a roller it just felt mm. emotional roller coaster mm. um you know and we were also big drinkers at the time big partiers so the emotions were compounded because we were always hung over or we were always drunk or we were always like, so we, it was pretty, pretty crazy times. How could you get the high quality of work done with drinking all the time? Well, just early, early 20s. If, if, if I drink just, tonight, I'm doing nothing tomorrow. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I don't know. We, we, we just, we had so much to do that we just had to make it happen. Um, mm. And I don't know. Maybe your generation's just not as tough. <laughs> Do you reckon <laughs> you could have done more? There's this whole monk mode thing that's going around at the moment, and well, it's going around for the last couple of years yeah. where people don't drink. They, you know, they're, they're really focused. Sex. Well, it, uh, that depends. I don't know if that's in monk mode, but oh, yeah, sort of is. There's definitely a thing people do, like retention and yeah. all of that stuff. Semen retention. What do you think about all of that? Uh, I, I think people make a bigger deal than that. I mean, there's a long history. I'm not advocating for for either. I'm just saying there's a long history of very successful people being alcoholics in Wall Street. Mm. Um, there's a long history of people who don't go monk mode and they eat themselves into obesity. And they yeah, there's all sorts of people who do that sort of stuff as well. Uh, you know, people are people are always looking for some sort of like weird secret sauce. The weird secret sauce is making sales. Mm. You know, like if you can pick up the phone and make sales, and if you can generate leads and 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 drive business um you know some some of the some of the best sales people i've ever had on my team are pretty dysfunctional people um they're just good at making sales and and um there's nothing wrong with monk mode if you want to have a morning routine and get in the spa and the sauna and the ice bath and this that and the other and that's what works for you great Uh, (laughs) i'm i'm all for i'm all for it if it's working for you but you know but don't kid yourself that 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 is what makes a successful business i mean if we're talking just what makes a successful business uh working really long hours and making lots and lots of sales calls and doing big deals and getting deals across the line and getting people to sign documents is what makes a successful business Mm. so you're around in london sort of 2009 area when the big recession hit and it took me a good three years to recover from that same same yeah, that's what my question was going to be. How did it hit you? Like a ton of bricks. Yeah. A ton of bricks. 2009, we've, we are off to a great start. 2006, I arrived. End of one, that we've been here one year. We put on an event at the London Palladium Theatre. That's big. It's, it was 2000 seat event. And it was in the middle of summer. There's no air conditioning. Everyone's sweating. But it was such a great event. We brought in speakers from around the world. Um, and then the following week, we make six, seven hundred thousand dollars worth of sales, like just on the momentum of that event in a week. And like suddenly, we're just like we've only been here twelve months. No, no, you know, barely set up a house and you know, all this stuff, and it's and it's just going. And then I remember the Obama campaign, and like it was so exciting that 
the world felt really positive because Obama was coming and, you know, his speeches were incredible. And, you know, there's the Will I Am song with Obama's voice and everyone kind of like this Obama 08 campaign really kind of took over. Mm. I remember that happening. And where we were running great events and everything, building a team and taking on this. And then suddenly, oh, there's this financial crisis is happening in, in the New York and, and maybe in London too and all this sort of stuff. And then he's like, oh, okay, that's weird. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that's and what I thought. Is that thoughts were or whatever we've been from before? Yeah. And it was like, and then suddenly it was like the taps got turned mm-hmm. off. So it was the cash stopping, wasn't it? I mean, other recessions have been sort of lower amounts of money in people's pockets a bit, but this was cash. This was a hard off. stop. Yeah. yeah. This was like, this was like no one could get a credit card and no one could get, no one, suddenly no one would trust anyone and no one would offer any, like all the wheels of commerce just stopped. Mm. And it was just horrible. And it was, um, you know, it was also, I remember it also being very cold that winter, a lot of ice around and I slipped on the ice and it was very, it was freezing cold and it was just miserable. And, um, and it was just like nothing good. And, uh, you know, for us, I think we lost 90% of revenue. It was like, we went from 4 million plus to like 400,000. Most of that was collections. And I had to fire all the team, 17 people and, um yeah it was just a miserable time and it, mm. and it took forever to get going again it was yeah. it was not until 2012 olympics that people felt good again yeah so, we were lucky to have that weren't we in this country because i think we got an early lift yeah because of that yeah it was just that was the that was there was that moment when london came to life for the olympics and suddenly london was the center of the world and everything felt good again. Mm. But it, hadn't it was quite a weird time, wasn't it? Because um, when we said, right, we got the Olympics, it's going, oh, bloody hell, we're, we're going to make a right pig zero of this. You know, look what's happened in the Olympics before. How are we mm. ever going to live up to that? And we did. Yeah. And it was fantastic. And we, and we seemed to, the, 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 the rumour was that we had no money because of the financial crisis, mm. so it's going to be the worst Olympics ever. So everyone's expectations were low. But then you realise that Britain has so much culture yes. and it was leveraged in that opening ceremony that suddenly there was so much great British history to, to talk about and there was so many talented creative people who got involved and it was magical. That opening ceremony just was like a, 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 mo- a lift, a moment. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. During like recessions, why don't you think companies actually you know, ran to you to create more leads for their business because surely that's the thing that they need? So in order to operate. We'd, we'd significantly changed our model at that point. So what I'd done is I'd done two deals to bring in one speaker from the US to the UK market and one speaker from Asia to the UK market. So the speaker from Asia, his whole business started collapsing because it impacted Asia in a massive way. And he just said, I need to focus on my core business in Singapore. Um, and he also owed us some money um, and couldn't pay it. And we couldn't continue doing business with someone who was behind right so we had to stop um, and we tried to juggle some some equity deals and this that and the other and some negotiations didn't go so well and basically it was like okay hard stop that stops so that was like two million of revenue right and we just so it wasn't that the customers had stopped it was that we cut off that relationship that was a big pipeline of revenue for us um, and then the second thing that happened was that um, this guy in the US uh, we owed him 140,000 US dollars, which was 70,000 pounds. And we'd provisioned 70,000 pounds. But around that time, the US dollar and the pound just went whoosh, and it just mm. like slipped and it was in a week. Mm. And suddenly I think we owed him like 95,000 pounds. So we were 25,000 short and we said, hey, look, we've got the 70,000. And he's like, well, you owe me another like 50 grand or whatever in his money. And we were like, well, yeah, we haven't provisioned for that. And now we've got this stuff going on and, and we just lost this and this is happening. And he's like, well, we can't do business. So we couldn't do business with them in, in, in because of that one. And then he cut off doing business with us because we owed him this extra 25 grand. Could you have not just found it though if it was that crucial? I know it sounds <sighs> yeah, silly. Yeah, it does. Stick it on the credit card. It was yeah. just, <laughs> Could you not just find it? Do you know, it was silly. It was... I think our proposal was to just like give us two weeks or something like that. And he threw his toys right out the pram and was like, no, well, I don't, you know, I'm not coming back to the UK anyway. Oh, that was the other thing. The other thing was, is that 
he wanted to keep his fees in the US dollars. But so we did end up paying him the extra 25 grand. That wasn't actually the, that wasn't the showstopper. The showstopper was that the pound to dollar ratio had slipped so far that it was no longer economical for us to bring him. So we said, oh. we proposed to him, we will keep paying you, we'll keep bringing you to the UK, but we'll pay you the pound equivalent that we were paying you and you can take the conversion risk or we can meet somewhere in the middle, but it's going to be a big recession, right? We're seeing that, but we can't, we can't have a situation where your commission and your fees has now gone up effectively 30, 40%. Um, we can't bring you yeah, out. It's, it's, just not, it's not going to work for us. So we were trying to negotiate. Can we, and he was just like, there's no negotiating. This is my fee. It's in US dollars. If you don't want to take me, don't take me. And if you don't want to take the deal, don't take the deal. But I'm not going to take, I'm not going to take any hit whatsoever on this. So we found ourselves basically with no, nothing to sell. So we had this whole team and no product. Yeah. Wow. So what, um, what did you do next? Like, how did you get out of that hole? <laughs> It's quite gripping. Yeah. <laughs> What's the next part oh, of the story? You, you guys are tra you traumatizing me here, yeah. going back through all of this stuff. Um, so what happened was um, I had to come up with something and I figured I was going to launch something small. So the big thing at that particular time, 2009, was businesses were starting to cotton on to social media. And the reason that was is Obama had won the US election with this thing called Twitter and mm -hmm. these YouTube videos. And there was like, there were YouTube videos that had a million views. Oh my goodness. How on earth is that happening, right? So that was happening and Obama had like YouTube videos with a million mm -hmm. views and there were Twitter accounts that had, a, you know, a, a million followers. So people were starting to pay attention. What the hell is this social media thing? And how can we monetize and it? Yeah, and what, are we meant to do something with it with our business? Yeah. Like, is this part of the marketing? So I started running some uh, little campaigns around how to use social media to b build your business and how to do lead generation through social media. And I took some of the IP that I had around lead generation and started kind of piecing it together with how you might use it with social media. I ran this little workshop called You Blogging Twitface. Um, and it was YouTube, blogging, Twitter and, and Facebook. And and so we had this uh, like little little workshop and then I did this other one called like uh, Social Media Launchpad and we, we were just kind of experimenting with what products might co co come together. And so entrepreneurs were showing up and they were basically doing these little mini um, mini workshops that we were running on that. And that was just a way of kind of like doing something, um, you know, getting getting out there. And learning about the product, really. Learning about this new trend ourselves. Mm. And Do you uh, think the, the internet coming in and social media becoming so important would have disrupted the events business anyway? No, ha had that not happened, we were we were already on board for... we. The truth is, is we probably would have ended up as really big YouTubers. Um, we, were, we were, at that particular time, we were figuring out how to broadcast on YouTube and all this sort of stuff. We were, we were really starting to make roads into it. Um, and we were moving across from all of our old marketing strategies to these new ones. And bringing that message to the many. Before yeah. the social media, when it all came crashing down, did you have any safety net at this point? Any personal wealth at all? I had some money. Uh, well, the business had some cash. And by the time we cleared out the the 25 grand, then my other business partner wanted to cash out. So that was a big chunk that, that went out. And there was three or four payrolls that were like 60, 70,000 each. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and basically then we threw some money into launching some campaigns to just sort of start the engines going again. But like, no, it didn't feel like I was sitting on a ton of like the business was was uh, bleeding cash. So period. what? Why was your thought process like when everything was thriving to not just try and like squirrel some money away and accumulate like half a million of personal wealth or something like it, that along these years? Because every time I threw, if imagine you had a box, every time you put seven thousand in the box, thirty five thousand comes yeah. out of the box in ten days. How much would you put in the box? Yeah, I understand everything. Right. So uh, I was just I was winning. And people are like, oh, you can go in the stock market and make 7% per year compounded. And I'm like, fuck, I make 7% yeah. in a week. Like, mm. like I'm, I'm smashing it. So basically, you can't go from a million a year to a million a month in three years without putting everything back in. Like, that's just because we didn't have external funding. I funded the whole thing off my credit cards and like. It's crazy. Yeah. So like in hindsight being 2020, but it kind of for me, it just took off really fast. And I just, you know, I just was, was, uh, had the tiger by the tail and, and just living in the moment. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And just doing doing what made sense at the time. So how did the social media side of things start to progress from there? Uh, so I ended up writing a book in 2010 called Key Person of Influence. And this was where I said, okay, the next big trend, the big, big, big trend is going to be becoming an influencer and building personal brand. And I was like, this is going to be huge. These technology engines, these are going to the, – the, the Silicon Valley's pumping – billions of dollars into these engines that essentially build personal brands that get you leverage as a person. So I launched this book, Key Person of Influence, and I basically said the world is changing fast and you need to really keep up with this and you should position yourself as a key person of influence. This is going to be a big asset. So I think I was one of the very, very first to get a book out about this topic and um, and to actually not make it about social media because a lot of people were writing books about social media, but I was writing about what you should do about it. Um, what, and th- what made you see it as something different from like a cringy site that people can upload videos to versus like a business thing that you can actually use? The, I had been running big events for, for the best part of, I don't know, 10 years, not quite, eight, seven years. And we had always had authors and speakers and those types of people on a stage. And we knew the power that they had in business. And then when I saw these social media engines, I was like, oh, this how, plus... How much you can multiply that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, my goodness, this is like going to be steroids for these types of people. You know, these people at the time, they relied upon PR, like getting on a breakfast show and this yeah. sort of stuff, which happened once every quarter. It's like if they can do their own social media promotion, this is going to be big. So um, so we started running that and then I ran the Key Person of Influence Accelerator and then that took off and then that took off so fast that we opened up offices all over the world. So Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. And Sydney, you're back again. Back, <laughs> back again. And yeah, we had eight offices around the world and each office is doing like a million a year. And um, yeah, so back, back rock and rolling. So from all of that, what would you say um, to some people that now are trying to start a business, you know, entrepreneurs, starting up maybe 20 years of age, what should they do and where should they focus their time and energy? So I can't understate the importance that almost all businesses, when we think about when we think about a business, we think about what the business does in terms of what it supplies, right? So I, your radio control business, right? Mm. So the obvious thing to think about is, oh, what do you sell? Oh, you've got airplanes and helicopters and remote control cars and all this sort of stuff. It's like, okay, that's what you sell. Mm. So the obvious thing to think about is, oh, well, how do I get some of those to sell? But actually, the majority of actual business is generating the demand, right? So actually getting people to want the thing. You can import a container full of remote control cars doesn't mean you'll be able to sell them, exactly. right? As you've as as you probably have seen yeah, people yeah. try and do, right? Yeah. In your industry, people come in and they want to copy what you've done, exactly. right? Well, you've got to see a gap in the market and why people are doing it probably wrong. Those that are doing it right, mix it all up, do your own spin on it and, and make it happen. Mm. Um, I think that's what I did when I started. And, and uh, I think something cool you did was with your designs, you were you getting them seen in clubs, weren't you? So yeah. all the people in the clubs were telling their friends about it and so word of mouth was you crazy. You figured out how to turn on the tap. Yeah, right. we try to do like social media before it was social media. And I always look at it now and think, oh, social media was around when I started. You should have just well, started Facebook. Well, yeah, probably, but there we are. <laughs> yeah. So the advice I would have is you need to figure out how to do turning on the tap. Turning on the tap is everything. So when we talk about laps, how do you generate a lead? How do you do an appointment? How do you do a presentation? How do you make sales? Unless you have Mark Zuckerberg level of coding skills, right? If you've got some amazing rare skill or talent, fine. Okay, great. Do that. But turning on the tap is everything when it comes to, to business. And it's if you think about the industrial age, the hard thing was supplying something, right? So Henry Ford became very, very wealthy because he figured out how to make cars fast and cheap. Yeah, the people production who, line. Production line, producing the supply. The people who make money today are people who figure out how to generate demand fast and cheap. So the supply is easy now. Um, if you go on Amazon and search for any product, it's going to give you a hundred different options for that product. You want to search for microphone stands. There are 50 different companies that are that are doing microphone stands. So the supply side's easy. The hard thing is the demand generation. And that's where all the money is. So 
the the for for a normal person who doesn't have coding skills or you know some amazing skill, leads, appointments, presentation, sales. Figure out how to do the tap. All starts with leads. Yes. Everything's downstream from lead generation was a was a great lesson I got from John, my first mm-hmm. mentor. So how do you generate a lead? Here's a couple of ways, right? Get people to turn up to an event is a lead. Get people to join a group. Uh, so like have a Facebook group or WhatsApp group, that's a lead. Uh, get people to fill in an online form, a scorecard, a quiz, that's a lead. That essentially those things generate leads. Those that's a, it's a micro. It's, you think of it as a little expression of interest that someone is expressing interest. Oh yeah, I, I, I might do business with you. I'm not committing mm. to it, but it's I'm, much easier to do business with someone who's got an interest in what you're doing, yeah. isn't it? And and rather than someone kind of like throwing, you know, the fish isn't going to jump it out of the water and into the boat. And the customer's not going to just say, hey, take my money. But they will say, oh, I'll attend an event on that. Right. Mm-hmm. So let's say you're, you know, I was talking to your friends who have the fitness business. If you say, will you sign up to a five grand body transformation? The answer is probably no. Will you come and have a look at an, an online event that we're running called How to Do a Body Transformation? And it's free. Yeah, okay, I'm interested in that. So then you, that's a lead, right? So they turn up the lead, fill in this online quiz. Um, are you ready to do a body transformation? Answer 20 questions and find out, right? That's We call that a scorecard. How important do you think having um, a personal profile on social media is to all of that? Because I'm just imagining, like you said, the fitness business mm. downstairs, they obviously are starting a YouTube channel yeah. and then they can then have a lead magnet of some sort to then convert so, those people. I would say that it's going to get harder and harder and harder now, especially with AI, to get cut through in a noisy marketplace and to build that personal brand. However, you don't need to. I just did a part. I just did a partnership with a guy who's got a couple of million followers um, to be a brand ambassador. I did a brand ambassador deal, and that is a no money down deal. Where once those once that attention that he's got can come over to us and we can monetize that attention, we can pay back some commissions. So in in some ways, it's actually almost a strength to not have a personal brand because you can go and do deals with five people who do. And you can actually not compete with them. You can say, hey, you guys are the you guys are the celebrities. We'll we'll work with you and we'll help you and so you know we'll we'll do what you need us to do to work with your channel and your thing. We know how to do this monetization piece. I bet you know lots of people who have got millions of followers, but they're struggling to monetize their following. Yeah, they, they don't because they're so focused on content. And but, but how long do you think that's going to be the case? Because obviously we're seeing Mr. Beast with Beast Burger and um, Prime by Logan Paul and KSI. Mm. Like these influencers seem to be starting businesses of their own. So are they going to be doing this kind of marketing forever? And also, would they wouldn't do it for no money down, would they? Because once they find ways to make money, yeah. it's like, why am I going to well, work the, for you to potentially not get a lot back if it doesn't work? For starters, the really big ones might do that, but also. The really big ones often look for a good partnership, but keep in mind an elephant doesn't want to mate with a mosquito, right? There has to be some sort of a, you know. So it would not surprise me if Mr. Beast's uh, burger place was a partnership with someone who knows how to do burger chains. Mm. And that it, to it be is fair, a, I think it probably is. Yeah. Like yeah, the cool. ghost kitchen. And the same and with Prime as well. Yeah. Prime is a. I don't know the name of them, but they're a well-known drinks manufacturer yeah. and they own a percentage share of Prime. That's it, right? So yeah. it's And they're it, behind the scenes and you think that it's KSI and Logan Paul that own it, but actually... What really happens is someone brokers a deal and the, the Logan Paul and KSI, they go into a big office in a big building and they say, well, what do you want the drink to be like? Oh, we want it, we want it to be like this. Okay, our team will mock up some designs for yeah. it, right? Do you like these? Yeah. What are you thinking about the name? Oh, we're thinking about this. Well, our team will come with 18 different names. Pick a name. Okay. What do you think you want the ingredients to be? Oh, we want it really, really super sugary. Super. Mm. Okay, great. More sugar. Let's do it. Right. So they're going to come in and just, they, they know how to do this stuff and they are going to say, all right, cool. We've designed it. We've got the bottling, the distribution, the, all of that sort of stuff. You guys go promote, do your bit. Mm. Um, and that's how that would have actually happened. So uh, you, you essentially, if you're just starting out, you don't need Logan Paul to launch with, right? So you need someone who's got 35,000 followers, but they're engaged and you're going to start your business and you're going to have a little product or service. You're going to come up with a monetization strategy. They're going to be able to focus on growing their following and their engagement. You're going to focus on how to turn some of that into leads, appointments, presentations, and sales. Um, uh, you know, we, with Score App, we've been doing deals with people who've got big followings and 
what we do is we build a scorecard with them and we get people who like, you know, we have done deals with people who've got tens of millions of followers, but they will just do an Instagram story about, hey, take my scorecard, take my quiz and 4,000 people a minute start taking that scorecard, that quiz, and then they can turn that into a business. It's very hard to go from just having millions of Instagram followers to saying to them, go buy something. But if you say, go to my free quiz, go to my free scorecard, that begins the series of events where you can then use that data to figure out, okay, well, how do we do this and how do we do that? And 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 But you need, what you actually need is you need an engine on that. This person's never going to be able to do that because they're so focused on the keeping up with the content and creating good quality content. They're going to need a partner who's going to help turn that into. Do you think that would be little businesses that are started up now or the bigger players coming in and, and noticing, oh, they can do these partnerships? Oh, it'll just be relative in size. So if I was starting out right now, I would be finding people who are 10 to 50,000 followers um, because they're too small for the big companies. So the elephant and mosquito again. Yeah. 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 Would you be worried about maybe tying your brand to an influencer that you aren't fully in control of? And if they do anything and get cancelled, then that brand may in, go down in the drain. In my experience, uh, in my experience now, I would if if I had some sort of a product funnel, I would definitely be doing it with multiple. Mm. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be putting eighty percent in one basket like I did. Right, I would have yeah created a scalable. Like you said about before. Yeah, spread your risk. Spread, spread the risk. But with that said, when you're starting out, you got to you got to go all in on something. Um, mm. You know, going all in also wasn't such a bad thing. We we did really really well on that. It just came down to one really silly meeting where we had a falling out. <laughs> it was a strange. Mm. I imagine if you're doing like eighty percent of your work with one business, you know their business so well, and you can yeah, yeah exactly. get better get results for them. Get really really good at it. Yeah. Do you think you would be better or worse off if you didn't leave that boardroom that day? Uh, with hindsight, I would have known how to structure a deal where we could have gotten out and taken a big chunk of shares, replaced, because I've sold companies now, right? So things have, you know, that was a long, by the way, that yeah. was 20 years ago. Um, and even the story we got up to is 10 years ago. So um, in the last 10 years, I've built and sold companies, I've, I've bought companies, I've sold businesses, um, I've, in, you know, gotten heavily into the investing side of things as well. So... Yeah, with the benefit of hindsight, I now know how to structure a deal where we wouldn't have thrown our toys out the pram. We would have just said, okay, let's roll that company in, mm. let's get the 14. The deal doesn't suit us. Yeah, the way I would have pitched it today would have said, look, as a publicly listed company, you can't you can't be running the way we've been running. We need to bring in some people who, we need to take some of the capital and put it into growth, raise it, like we will roll in, but we're also going to need this amount of capital to build out the team. I would have put in place a plan for nine months to roll out personally, retain the shares, and replace myself in the business. Um, so I would have, you know, I would have structured it uh, differently. But mind you, I was twenty-four. Yeah, of course. I had no idea what was possible. Do you see gaining experience as more important than qualifications? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but blood noses. That's what you need. Mm. You need you need to be punched. Yeah. You need you need punches in the face. You don't learn school of hard knocks. Yeah. You you you. you your brain doesn't remember anything that it doesn't assign either pain or pleasure to. So if you're just going to school and it's it's, right. it's a normal day, mm. you don't assign any meaning to it. So you won't remember anything. You remember the reason I have vivid memories of all this stuff is because it was emotional, right? Mm. It was a painful yeah, experience. Yeah, and for me. You know, so I I remember the those ups and downs mm. and I remember how I feel and I remember what it was like to slip on the ice that day and I remember punching a wall and like being so helpless at that particular moment when the financial crisis and everything's going bad and I'm like bang and I, I thought I was punching a, a, a soft wall a, a plaster wall and I punched a brick wall and almost bro broke my hand and you know all of that sort of stuff so um there's there's dumb there's dumb mistakes you make and you shouldn't be afraid of those you should actually say that's part of it right? well, it's, it's, I always say it's learning a lesson because if you make a mistake you learn a very important lesson and if it's cost you to yeah. learn that lesson you, you're not gonna have to learn that lesson again are exactly. you exactly and also with um, um, qualifications I always think that it, it shows a person might be able to do the job that you want them for as experience mm. shows you they will be able to do the job you want them for which yeah. is a completely different yep. thing exactly and when you do the job you tend to do a lot of reps, a lot of repetition. When you're learning academically, you tend to learn something once mm. you study for the exam and it's the 
it tends to be that when you're actually like like the events company, we did 174 events that year. So that's 174 repetitions of filling an event, literally inviting people in, getting people seated, playing the music, like putting the speaker up on the stage, you know, organizing everything. You, you go through repetition after repetition and you figure out how to fine tune it. If you were to academically do that, it would just be a case study that you would do one time and you'd look at it and you go, okay, yeah, I think I get the gist. But I think a lot of people are trying to avoid pain. It's like... It's part of the process. You know, you don't get to have a baby without the labor, right? Mm. And you don't get to have a great business without being punched in the face. And there's all these there's all these weird things that get good clicks on YouTube, like work-life balance and like morning routines and all this sort well, of stuff. Well, what are your thoughts on work-life balancing? Because that was one of the questions I was going to ask you yeah. because I always felt that I didn't have a work-life balance when I started out. I was full on. If I was awake, I was working. How, how while old, I was working, uh, I was sleeping. How old were you when you got work-life balance? Oh, um, well, you could probably answer that. Probably about when you were. I 16 don't know if you still have it. So. Yeah, I was going to say. I don't know if you still <laughs> no, have it now. I definitely have work work-life balance now. No, well, you, yeah. you don't. When I'm going like, oh, we're filming today. You're like, oh, didn't know about that. So. Well, yeah, but if you're. If you're committed to something else, you're committed to something else. But I would say um, I probably gained it back at about 40, f well, 40, probably let it go again and then picked it up probably about 45 yeah. and I'm 55 now. So I've got three little kids. I and thought you were 70. <laughs> He's charming. This is an, on <laughs> it's an ongoing thing. This, yeah, no, so. he didn't just come out with that. Well, That's what they've been saying in the comments. We so. thought we thought you were twelve. Yeah, that, <laughs> I get that too. I get that too. So we have drawn that's, on. That's, that's why we tash. got the moustache. Yeah. Then, so yeah. How old do you actually think he is? Twenty-three. Twenty-four. Yeah, twenty-four. 24. We're same both same day. There you go. I had no work-life balance at all. If I was yeah. awake, I was working. Same same thing, right? Mm. And I roll out of bed and. Um, you know, we, we just we, we just worked all the time, like all the time. And like we ran events on the weekend and uh, we'd take people out partying on, on a Friday night, Saturday night. And um, we'd go to dinners with people on the evenings and we'd often find ourselves out till like 11 o'clock with clients and then, we, you know, start again. At Did eight. you feel guilty when you weren't working? Did you feel like I should be there where I should be creating? I don't, I don't remember. I just didn't mm. have anything else. I, I, I felt guilty because I had a girlfriend who kept nagging me to yeah. have uh, more work time life with balance. Them. The only, the only, um, for me, I felt no pressure to have work life balance. I loved belligerent focus. Like, do you have it now? I do have it now. When did I, you find it? What age? With kids, with kids. So, um, as soon as I like, because kids very rapidly become the most important and special thing. And you, you, you know, for me, I became aware that these moments go real fast, that 12 months go fast and they're no longer that, that little, 10 years goes fast. Yeah. That little baby that you, that feels weightless and like just fits in your hand, fits in your hand. Ma amazing, isn't yeah. it? And then suddenly, <laughs> I guess I know at some point yeah, you can connect on this suddenly walking and then it's like, Whoa, okay. And then that came quick. And then full sentences come and like all this sort of stuff. And like, the next thing they're starting podcasts and shit. Starting podcasts <laughs> and yeah, doing deals. Yeah. And, and collecting watches. Yeah. And uh, so so for me, I, I became really aware that actually if I if I miss this, I miss this. Like it, you, I'm not gonna get this back. Um, so I got three lovely little kids and the pandemic changed everything as well. Cause up leading into the pandemic, my you know, we we st even now we still have offices around the world, but Leading into the pandemic, I had offices all over the world and I regularly would visit and go and do stuff. And, um, you know, so it wasn't abnormal to do a Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne trip or a Singapore trip or, um, you know, any of those sorts of things. Mm. And then suddenly the pandemic hit and we just do everything on Zoom and it's like, oh, okay, I can really. So technology has given me huge work-life balance. Mm. You've got to also remember people might judge what it was like uh, for you starting your business and me starting my business, we didn't have the tech. Mm. You had to you had to have face to face meetings. You had to waste a lot of time. I still think they've got their place. I mean, uh, I've got an Asia tour coming up, yeah. and that is mostly to. And I, he hates his term, but oh, I quite most, like it. Now. Be it's right. become your it's, thing. It's mostly to press, press the flesh. Press the flesh. Yeah. yeah, and and when you do that, particularly around Asia, you get a lot more loyalty from yeah. your manufacturing yeah. companies and the people you're working with. Um, so I haven't been on that tour for 
but I think it's four years, isn't it? Near enough now. Yeah. I sort of COVID miss that, though, though. Like everybody doing stuff in person. It's like if we ask someone to come on the podcast, mm. they're like, oh, can I do Zoom? It's like, fuck no. Yeah, we, no. we, we yeah. don't do yeah, any like, podcasts I, on Zoom. Yeah, and I, I agree. There are certain things that are that are really they're, they're to do in person. But I will say that a lot of the um, things that get clicks uh, are things that sound really good and sound nice. Like, oh, you know, I don't work and I do, you know, mm. I do two mm. hours a day and all this sort yeah. of stuff. And it's like I've seen behind the scenes on some of these people who say that they have work life balance. Yeah. And if their if their business is growing, they're all in. And they're, you know. Now the other thing too is there's work and there's work. So there's work where you're like working a really boring, repetitive job. And then there's work where you're traveling around running events and enjoying doing, it. And it and it's just epic. Yeah. Like it's so great. And you know, you feel like you're kicking doors down and you feel like you're like you're signing contracts and you're yeah. making money and you know it's all happening and you it's not like you're sitting there going oh i've got another i've got to go to another michelin star mm. restaurant tonight and take <laughs> yeah. clients out oh you know. you're not down a coal mine digging coal are you not digging ditch, ditch, did, did you ever like lose relationships over this hectic work schedule yeah 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 I lost and how did that feel like a breakup mm. yeah yeah I, I remember one i broke up with a girl who i'd been with for three years and we broke up on the 14th of february because oh it's valentine's day oh Oh, it's Valentine's Day. Well, have you have you planned anything? No, 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 I haven't <laughs> thought about it. Uh, did, did you feel guilty, or were you like, "Well, I'm, I've got to work. You know, um, I love what I do, and this mm, is part of me." Yeah, I felt conflicted. Yeah, I felt that it was, you know, especially you know at that time it was my first proper serious long relationship. So I, I thought I did. I probably thought I should have done something for Valentine's. Like it was just a silly error, mm. but. It was, it was just the fact that it was the final straw. I, Us and guys in business make those sort of errors, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So how did you get through it? Just focus more on business? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, I, I was just, what it feels like when a business is growing really fast is it feels like you're always just behind on several things. Mm. And there's two to three months worth of things. If you, if you want to stop, you would have to like make a decision now and then unravel yourself over the next three months. Because you're in a relationship with your business, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. That's the thing. And you've got the tiger by the tail. It's not like in many cases with a very fast growth business, it's not like you can just simply dial it back. There, there's things that there's just a certain number of things that have to happen. And you're, when, take, when it takes off and it really takes off, and like you've made sales and orders are coming in and this now this leads to three problems and those problems need solving and then this has to happen and then this and this idea that you could somehow just you know sort of dial it to the perfect work life balance that would please everyone it's just not going to happen and the obvious answer when you've when you've had no money and then suddenly the money's rolling in. The obvious answer is let's like I don't know how long this is gonna last. Yeah, so I've got to keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Let's, let's do you ever regret like working so hard and, and maybe that was the one? Or do you think that you found no, the one? The, because, the, opposite, the yeah, opposite. The opposite. I, I actually I actually feel like a lot of people are missing out. Mm. I feel like a lot of this generation that are buying into the hype, um, and that are like sitting there thinking that they're getting ahead doing an ice bath. And it's like I, I just or a sauna or a sauna. <laughs> uh, I feel like they're gonna regret work life balance. That they're gonna get like they haven't made the money young enough, perhaps. Yeah, because what's going to happen <clears throat> is they're going to get to a certain age where they have kids and then they're going to go, Oh, I've got no money. Like, um, and and also I've lost momentum. Like I'm now the so they're going to sit there and go, actually, I've got peers who are my age who've got just a lot more experience than me. And, uh, yeah, like I'm, it's hard because it's hard because when people say work-life balance, like I get it that if, you're, if you work a really shitty job, mm. then – but personally, I would if, – if it were me, if I was working a really shitty job, I would be doing side hustles. Like yeah. I'd be getting All myself – Or changing your job. I'd be getting out of that, yeah. Yeah. And I think you should work really, really hard, really hard to you about 30, 35. And it's not just to put that money away and just work hard. It's literally – if you work that hard to 30, 35, that momentum will continue. Yeah. And actually you find it hard not to work that hard. Yeah. So yeah. that's – you're just going to create so much. Well, here's an example, the books. So – I was flying around the world all the time on planes and I made a deal with myself 
that the first three hours of every flight was writing. I'm going to write books um, because I wanted to build those assets and I wanted to capture my learnings and I wanted to do that. It would have been very, very easy to have watched movies and, you know, enjoyed the whole, you know, the, the just... Or enjoyed the business class experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? That would have been easy, but I just went, no, no, my deal is three hours of writing and, and then I will watch a movie or get to sleep, yeah. but I'm just going to do the first three hours of writing. And I ended up writing four best-selling books. Mm. And as a result of those, I get invited on great podcasts and I get invited to speak and... Um, you know, I own all these companies now and um, if I want to raise capital, I can raise capital very easily. If I want to, you know, if, if I need three million, it'd take me, you know, weeks mm. and, and we'd have it. Which is the most popular selling book? Because the one I haven't read, which I want to read, is Oversubscribed. Oversubscribed was a very was, was a very big seller. So yep. that one, that one, uh, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies. Yeah. And is that the best seller one or? Uh, they all, so... Key person of influence, we used it as a business tool to generate a lot of business. So we gave away ten to 20,000 copies a year for many years. So How I was, does that count in the best-selling thing if you're giving them away? Do I, you, I, you physically I, buying them and yeah, then giving them No, away? no, I'm buying them from the – I'm buying them. I, I now, from the publisher. Yeah, so it goes yeah. into the sales yeah. thing because yeah. you bought them yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I've never – I mean, the, the KPI book has done, I don't know, something like 100,000 sales separate – um, but, um, yeah, we didn't give away a lot of these. The way publishing works is if you publish with a big publisher, so key, uh, Entrepreneur Revolution oversubscribed it with big publishers, they only pay you a small amount per copy and even if you buy them yourself. Whereas when you self-publish, um, so I ended up becoming the major shareholder of the publishing company, um, this one that does KPI and 24 assets and scorecard marketing. We represent 900 authors. But we've actually structured the the whole reason I got involved in that publishing company was to re to disrupt the publishing agreement. So what we've now done is we've created publishing agreements where it's built around people who want to give copies away to grow their business. So it's very easy for authors to get their first thousand copies to give as giveaway copies. Yeah, their big publishers won't do that. They want almost retail prices for the for the books, even if you're buying a thousand of them. So um, I said, well, wait a second. I don't want to sell books. I want to give books away that that generate business mm. so that was the original plan um because the, the big driver of the business actually was key person of influence we would give away this book and then page 55 or 68 on this one uh it says what gets measured gets improved we've to, we've created the key person of influence quiz answer 40 questions um go to this url answer 40 questions and see how you score as a key person of influence so ninety thousand people filled in that quiz, and fifteen million pounds worth of business came off it. Mm. Um, so, so is that only one shout out in the whole book, or is uh, it throughout in different pages? Because that's phenomenal. It might have. Yeah, I'm trying to get that conversion rate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The quiz. I mean, people love a quiz, right? Mm. That's yeah. how. That's how Score App was started. Yeah. Right. So people essentially- love a quiz. They do love a quiz. So you can, you could actually do like a YouTube, like evergreen YouTube video, and then lead to some kind of quiz. I was watching your video. Way. And you had don't start a business until you do these things, I think was the headline. And it was like 11 things, right? So you just take that content and you just say, are you ready to start a business? Answer these 11 questions and find out. So you do a landing page, you put that video on the landing page and then just say, take the quiz. So then people take the quiz, they answer, have I done the 11 things? Mm. And they could do scale of one to five or they could do yes or no or yes, no, sometimes. And then you might also put in an extra two or three questions to learn a bit about them, what they're up to, you know, what sort of business would you start? Um, are you funded? Um, do you have a team already? So you might just add a few little questions like that. So then you've now got all of that data, everything yeah. that just came from that quiz. You can see, oh, this is Daniel. He's got, you know, this many people mm. and this many of this. He's got funding. And, and what are they he, getting in return for that? Of, well, he's 40% of the way there. He feels to run in a business, yeah, so yeah. you can help him with the other sixty percent. Yes. The other thing so what, that what's like the promise of the quiz? Well, though? what are they, they doing? want to know? Well, I'm just going to say that the thing with it is, is if you can get them to that point, a lot of people don't start businesses because they don't feel they know enough. But if you get them to the point of that, and they've bought a course to help them get to that point, you can then give them that. And I've heard you say this: you can give them the certificate, and you're qualified to to go out and start your business. And I think that's. Well, the reason they take one the, of the ways yeah, of doing it. The reason they take the quiz is they want the the score, 
Yeah. And they... So what you say, test how well you are yeah. at running a business or are you ready to start a business? Yeah. Here's the score and then you Here's your score. It. You okay. score, you, so it might be you scored 39%. Here's our custom advice for you to get to 75%. Yeah, and that's your lead magnet. Right? Okay. And, then, yeah. and then that's it. Yeah, and it's the best lead magnet because most lead magnets are just name and email, but you don't know anything about them. Mm. And often they will just give you their basic email. So you can't even tell what they do by the... Or just a fake email. Or, yeah. or a fake email. Mm. Whereas with the scorecards, even if they give you the Gmail or something like that, you still have all this data about them on top. So you, you, you are like every single one of those 90,000 leads on the key person of influence scorecard, we've got 40 pieces of information about every single person. I set up another one called the 24 assets assessment. Um, and it was about digital transformation. So like 18,000 people took that one and we have, we literally have a blueprint of their entire business. Um, and we have made a lot of money off the back of that one as well. And it's basically people fill it in, they get the heat map, the, the blueprint of their business that says these are the 24 assets, these are the ones. We, we do a color coding, green, yellow, and red. And basically people then go, oh, okay, so I need to turn those red ones into orange ones and those orange ones into green ones. And it gives them a, a report that says here's, the, here's what you should do for each one of the 24 assets. It's a bit like um, what Cambridge Analytica did when they did all those different quizzes <laughs> they did. and then used the data to, to yeah. help Trump win the campaign. They did. So what they did is they got you to answer five or six questions which told them uh, something called the ocean graph. And the ocean graph is a psychological profiling tool, openness, conscientiousness, um, extroversion, neuroticism. Mm -hmm. um, so they have this um, uh, they have this ocean graph and there are certain people who depending on how you score on that makes you extremely susceptible to um, fear-based messaging mm. so what they did is they said if you scored here you're not going to respond to these kind of ads if you scored here you're going to highly respond so they basically ran a quiz to win a million dollars um, if you answered the quiz then they took that data they retargeted it through the algorithms and then they sent really like uh, and they didn't just do trump they did brexit they did yeah. all, all of these ones but essentially people underestimate how powerful a quiz is a quiz tells you a lot it's the power of data isn't it yeah the mm. data yeah exactly mm. especially now the world we're living in right now with this ai stuff i mean this just supercharges it we're, we're about to go through a and, major change yeah so we're plugging ai into all of our businesses now and it's like it makes your head spin it's incredible to see what's happening so i think it's time for your famous question then Oh no! When is enough? Enough. <laughs> when is enough? Enough. Why is that an important question? I'm curious. Why is that the famous question? This is just the question I ask Dad asks every, every time podcast. because it, it gets varied answers, and you yeah. can take it any way you wish as well. I, I should have scrubbed up for this one. Um, yeah. Uh, I think you feel it. You feel. You feel. So for starters, if you're doing something that you don't like doing to the extent that you have to get across a finishing line so that it's enough, I would say that's a bit of a red flag, right? So it's like I'm like only... waiting for retirement at 67 and really needing it. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, okay, I've, I've, done my, I've done my number, I've calculated the number and all that sort of stuff and I've just got to cling on for a little bit more. To me, that's a little bit of a red flag. Mm. Or if you're doing something that's uh, hyper, you know, really risky – Let's say, you know, an, an extreme example of like you're doing something illegal and it's like, oh, I'll just do one more bank robbery and then that's enough yeah. and I'll do one more bank robbery. And you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. So you're trying to calculate when is enough enough, right? Um, for me, I've only done stuff I love doing. I do stuff that's really fun. And as soon as I start to feel, this is just not fun anymore. Mm. And I, I pivot, I sell, I change. So it's uh, been enough for you. Yeah. all the way along the journey yeah, exactly. and then you change direction yeah and 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 life, i i really believe life just moves in chapters so there's a chapter called yeah, dan that's for sure. yeah dan the entrepreneur who's single and who's like this young 20 something year old entrepreneur living on planes checking in on hotels and then that there was a time where it just felt like that's enough i've i've done that chapter like mm. i've really i don't need to cling to that chapter so that's enough and then there's dan the dad with little kids and it's like ah oh, that feels good and also I wrote a book and I'm like, I don't need to write any more books anymore. But then I felt like I do want to write another mm. book. There's this other thing I want to say. So I wrote that book and I'm like, okay, I've got two books. I don't need to do any more books. And then 
and uh, done. I'm not. I'm not trying to be an author. But then I think about something. I, I'm in the. Sh- I'm, I'm seeing. I go. Oh, wait a sec. Twenty four assets. There's these assets, and we need mm. those ones. And oh, I should write this down. Right. Oh, this should be a book. Right. So then I write another book, and then, uh, and then I, you know, I have no plan to be a SaaS entrepreneur. But we create a piece of software, and it's like, ah, oh, this is cool. This mm. is great, and we can do so much with this. Let's build it. And it's like, okay, let's raise capital for it and let's do this and let's hire a team. And it's and exciting. And that's fun as well. It's super fun. Yeah. And then there will come a point, and I know roughly speaking, it'll be at around the 100 million mark where that business is worth about 100 million. And it will, I know what it, I know what happens at a certain point where it's like, okay, now it's board meetings and it's capital. Yeah, someone else can take that further. Exactly. And it's like, okay, the next jump will be from 10,000 customers to 40,000 customers. And the right partner for that will be someone who's already got about three, 400,000 person yeah. database. So you know what? Rather than trying to manufacture what they've got, I'll just sell it to them and then they can use their asset and grow that. So it'll just hit a point where it feels like I'm at the red line with this. I've, I've run this race and it feels like enough. So I think you you get to the point where you feel it. You just feel this like I'm just... I'm just living in the past with this thing. I'm not. I've got to the end of that chapter. That chapter's. I come, want to. Yeah, that, flip I think that's the, the best answer we've had. Start another one. Yeah, yeah that enough's cha- enough when the chapter's ended. When the, yeah, when the chapter feels like it, it gets to it gets to the feeling where you go, this chapter's done. I now f- I'm ready for the next chapter. Mm. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, I always look at them as lifetimes. You know, I, I talk about different things. Oh, that was a, that was a, a few lifetime lifetimes ago. ago. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's great to have lived. I think lots of lives. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So. So, and fun. the chapter of this podcast we, is coming to an end. And it, fe- it feels like we're done, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on. Really, really, really fantastic. Really, Total pleasure. Really, really good. If you guys have liked it, make sure to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And we will see you next Wednesday with a brand new podcast. So it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah, blah. How many goodbye. times? <laughs> bye. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to leave that, is yeah, yeah, it? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, and it's goodbye really from good. these guys. Laters. <laughs>